All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome aboard. If you guys are just now joining up with us, tonight's another one of those special streams we're really excited to bring to you. I have with me tonight one of our normal regular hosts, John Lonius. John, say hello, sir. Evening, all. Good to have you back. Also joining us tonight, we are very pleased to have Tim Talbot from P Pamplin Historical Park. I almost said Petersburg. Same thing. It's Petersburg. <laughs> Pamplin Historical Park. Really glad to have him here. Welcome aboard. Thanks for having me on. Oh, of course, Tim. We're really, really excited to have you, especially with tonight's topic. Like, We're really excited to actually kind of dive into this and just, you know, rather than have a whole on lecture, we get to sit here and have a discussion about it. And I think that's what, you know, really makes this place so special and having guys like you come on and be able to talk with us about you know what you do and how you experience the civil war what you teach and just the history that you know and get to live with and work with every day we love love to talk about that and hear that so again cool. thank you for being willing to come on and talking with us about that as well well you know it's really a breath of fresh air to have young people like you that are so interested in the topic to take your time and, and effort to start something like this uh, where people can join in and learn from tonight's it. another one of the the typical civil war enthusiast is you know, probably in his 60s or 70s. So it's really great to see uh, young people like yourselves uh, doing this sort of work. So congrats on that. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, so why we do is because, I, I mean, there's not quite, you know, we're a small group. There's not a lot of younger guys that are, or younger folks in general that are actually crazy involved with this. But the group that is, it is, like you said, it is incredible to see some of the passion and the just the effort that goes into making some of this stuff happen, especially when it comes to YouTube or just, you know, different ways to interpret history and how far they're going to study this stuff. It's, you're right. It is incredible to see. And I'm glad there are others out there that are doing this as well. And you guys are using, you know, taking advantage of all this technology, which I think is going to be um, a hook to the younger generation. So sure. Um, that's great. Sure. Well, one thing here on the stream that we really like to start with is kind of asking, how did you start with the Civil War? And, you know, history in general, what led you to really want to focus on this time period and study the war? Oh, way, it goes way back. Um, I was about 10 or 12 years old. Um, my dad took me to Perryville um, Battlefield in Kentucky. We lived in southern Indiana at that time. And uh, to go visit my grandparents in in Kentucky, uh, we drive near there. So he took me by there one time and uh, it just really captured my imagination. And then the following year, he took me to a reenactment there and to see all the um, uh, uniforms and the flags and um, guys firing off the artillery and stuff, it just really made it all come to life. And so uh, when I got back home from that trip, I had my mom take me to the library and I just checked out as many books as I could and just really dove into it um, and had a Civil War passion for several years. Um, when I got into high school, I kind of got away from it a little bit and got into to sports a little bit more. Um, and then when I was in college, and this sort of dates me, <laughs> um, I saw the, the Ken Burns series and that reignited that fire um, for Civil War history. And um, I didn't graduate with a history degree from college. I, I got a communications degree the first four years I went to school and I went to work in the business world for about 10 years and really got burned out, I needed to be in something that I was really passionate about. So while I was still in the business world, I started going back to get the hours I needed to complete my history degree at East Tennessee State University and uh, finished that up. And, and my advisor said, you know, if you want to go into museum work or public history, probably should go on and get your master's degree. So I immediately went uh, to Appalachian State who had a program close by that was well respected and um, finished that up in two years and took about six months to land my first job. But my first job was at Pamplin Historical Park. And unfortunately, about three years after I'd started, the recession hit in 2008. Mm. And uh, a lot of us in the, the field lost our jobs. But I was lucky, uh, I was out of work for about six months, but landed at the Kentucky Historical Society and had a great experience working there for six years. And um, when Pamplin got back on better financial footing, um, they had a director's position for education and interpretation and I applied for it and came back in 2015. So I've been back uh, 
almost six years now at Pamplin. So that's kind of my history of how history is so important. But I'm a voracious reader. I I am with you there. I think that that's a common thread amongst a lot of us that we just we don't put books down, do we? <laughs> no. John's you. I mean, none of us. We buy too many. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my there wife is. says, um, you know there is a thing called a library. You don't have to buy them. You can go borrow them. <laughs> yeah, we have our own libraries. We can borrow That's our right. own. Yeah, put it back on the shelf and we're done so we can read it again later. It, <laughs> come on now. <laughs> but that, and that's that's cool to have that too because I you know and there's this world of ebooks so I think honestly that's a heated topic recently a lot of people have been very pro ebook and you get a lot of people that have a lot of flack to that and I'm torn in the middle there are some books that I'm absolutely okay with having on ebook but then you know I get these I get these awesome hardbacks with great art on the front of it and they just it, the feel of having that real book in your hand still is just like that tangible book is much to me much better than flipping through a screen yeah i haven't gotten into the ebooks yet um it'd probably help on storage space and, oh for uh, sure not taking take up as much room but <laughs> i do like the hard copy myself too what i haven't I, i'm not much of an ebook guy but i i'm into i i dig audiobooks i do enjoy audible so i'm either i'm either i want it in hand or i want it read for me um <laughs> but i don't tend to don't tend to do don't tend to do ebooks much no, I'm surprised at how many books are available uh, audio wise now. Even some pretty what you would think would be um, academic or obscure titles are, are coming right. out on ebooks. So need to get a job reading those or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I uh, when uh, I, I drove, uh, I had to drive across country to get here to Virginia uh, when I first got the job here. And uh, what I listened to, what I listened to on the whole drive over was the audiobook version of uh, of the. Um, the Army of the Potomac trilogy, mm. um, which was a, a fun way to pass the time. Yeah, if you've got a commute or a um, significant amount of time, I think yep. that's a good way to do it. I get lucky with the, the train and being able to take the train into work because I can just sit there for almost an hour and a half and just pop a book open. I mean, that, you know, credit to that for me getting halfway through this Fredericksburg book already. <laughs> I love it. I'm just sit there. I should, I should probably say that what I mean the 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 for those listening, when mm. I say the um, the Army of the Potomac trilogy, I'm talking about Bruce Catton's Ooh, trilogy on the that. Army of the Potomac. So good. Because not everybody might not everybody's going to necessarily pick that up right away. No, uh, that's so a lot of people are intimidated by that, and, and you know I was having this discussion earlier with some historians today actually, and, and yesterday about um, and one thing I think. I'd never really fully understood when I first started studying this war. I got so excited that I could start grasping some of this military maneuver that I'm studying and just the, pretty much just the troop movements and how they were attacking. Like That was what I wanted to focus on at first. And I guess so much so that I really got just enveloped in that. And I didn't take the time to really branch out and look at some of the sociopolitical aspects. I didn't take the time to look out and try to read overall histories or read about different aspects other than just straight up military maneuvers on a field of battle. I think and, that's pretty common in the field uh, when people get interested and in become you know enthusiastic about the Civil War. They often start with the military, but then mm -hmm. uh, when they read a little bit um, more, they want to know the cause, they want to know the motivations, and it uh, leads to... A lot of different rabbit holes. <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. And I'm, honestly, I can equate it to the, uh, the first time you get bit by the bug and you know this is just what you want to do. This is your entire life's work. You know this is it. Yeah. And it, that would, it, it almost hits you again because you just open up these doors to these new things. Like, okay, you know, being up at the Capitol all the time and I'm reading a lot of these political things that are happening or just some of the fights that happen in this, you know, the day-to-day -day life of the congressman in the 1850s. A hell of a time to be a congressman, I'll tell you that much. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. But trying to walk I mean, through that got, now, you've got congressmen beating each other with canes, and carrying handguns <laughs> yep. into the into the chambers, um, not ground, uh, drag out fist fights, and people mm -hmm. pulling people's wigs off. And... <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful place to be! And did you know there were people selling souvenirs and like beer and food in the hallways? So after they'd come out of the floor from voting, they'd come out and get concessions. 
That's awesome. You know, I mean, after 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 a, an average meeting of the of the house and in, in 1859 and 1860, you might you might need a beer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they had some in their desk. They had something stronger than beer, though. <laughs> some corn liquor or something was in there. But I know uh, the the fun thing I like doing when it comes to this remote history. We'll get back on topic of Petersburg. Uh, there's a room in the Capitol that uses one of the administrative offices. And it's the old bread oven. There's a famous picture of it in Harper's Weekly too, of a, a soldier scooping bread out of an oven and passing it out a window. I use walk. Mm. I walked in that every day, and I'm looking. I'm like, did you see it? Like, I, dude was right there passing the bread right there. Like, what? And now there's just desks and office equipment everywhere. But you just those moments are awesome to look into it and be like, haha, this is cool. Or uh, Elmer Ellsworth's office, which is the, one of the Ways and Means Committee rooms now. It looks That's identical. Identical. It's interesting that people have that power of place. Um, you made that association, but how many people in, I don't know, normal society is the right word, but... <laughs> That's um, probably the right word. <laughs> non-history people, non-geeks, um, don't get the, the power of place when you're in a certain place that something happened, um, especially when you can have photographic evidence of mm-hmm. it and do your own personal then and now. It's just, it's a draw for me. 100%. Who knew I'd be living it, living history there one day? That was that was nuts, you know, and having to go through, you know, living and documenting that. But that's a cool thing about doing history work is sometimes you get in those positions where you can document it yourself. And it's, you can do what you read about. You can read these people's letters and, and, you know, and just kind of picture what they were going through. But to have a point where you can actually write a letter to is something that's still, I still honestly haven't put pen to paper yet. I can't, I have to really... You know, there's a process with that, but one day I do um, want to write about well, that. Well, it turns out living through history isn't necessarily as fun as studying it. No, mm. no, and I think there's a newfound respect that it's not that it's a guilt to have overlooked because I don't think it's something everybody would consider unless it was a position that they may have been in or in a situation, you know, so on and so on. But there is a newfound respect when you have similar instances of what you study happen and you can go now like read some of these things and really not look at it so much as just some distant past or some thing that you could never see happening and like that- yeah, i think um so many students when they learn history they become they become um keen to the idea of it's it's all meant to be and they mm-hmm. take out the fact that people's actions and decisions is what determines history Exactly. It, it can be so easy to fall into that, yeah. you know, that that idea that everything is is predestined to happen the way that it did, yeah. and and it's so it can be so difficult. It's sort of it's sort of you got to walk that fine line, right? We're understanding that like nothing is predestined to happen, you but you also don't want to fall too far down the counterfactual rabbit hole. It's always an interesting uh, line to walk. Yeah, but I've always thought that that's why so many people as young people don't really appreciate history because they don't see themselves as part of making history. Um, they think it's all faded. Um, that uh, the civil war happened because that's just the way it was supposed to happen rather than people making decisions. So I think teaching history, or figuring out ways to teach history to show um, contingency mm-hmm. to a certain aspect helps make people more uh, active participants in history. Uh, I, I, I agree. I don't see anything wrong with that at all. So I want to start talking about Petersburg because I, I would love to hear... I haven't actually been able to really talk with you about Petersburg before and it's something that I've recently started really taking an interest to because I realized how much of an empty void of information we actually have in a lot of published material and I feel like there's so much to be published later or researched at least... And I, yeah. that started me wanting to have an interest because I know there's gonna there's a lot I think we need to learn. And I've only researched up to about the fifteenth of mm-hmm. June, I believe it is the second offensive. That'd be the first. That'd be the first offensive. Okay. Yeah. Now there was a a, a previous attempt on Petersburg that was kind of half-hearted by General Benjamin Butler on June 9th. but most people consider uh, Grant's attempts. Uh, as those main nine offensives, and the first one being on June 15th. Hmm. 
That would make sense. And now the the one on June fifteenth, that was that invo- the, a USCT involvement, or was that the second offensive that was used? I now I, I might be a little confused here when it comes to this. Yeah. So that first uh, attempt on Petersburg on June fifteenth was largely fought. Um, it was fought by the Eighteenth Corps primarily. Um, it had um, two divisions of white soldiers and one division of black soldiers. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of a a mixed, but the USCTs are going to do particularly well um, there on June fifteenth. They have a fight first in the morning after they leave um, up near City Point uh, on Broadway Landing. They leave their camps and start moving down the City Point Road, and they run into an obstacle that the Confederates have put up, an earthwork that has some artillery and infantry manning it. And um, this is called the Battle of Baylor's Farm, and um, the USCTs are just gonna eventually overrun that position and capture a couple of artillery pieces. Um, So they get off to a great start, but they, the commander of the 18th Corps, William Baldy Smith, kind of gets a little bit of cold feet. If he'd have moved on toward Petersburg immediately, um, he would probably had a better chance. And some historians say that he could have uh, could have taken Petersburg that day, but he sort of slows things down and, and holds up right outside the main defenses around Petersburg, which is called the Damoc Line. Mm-hmm. Um, now, what's really ironic about the Damoc Line is that uh, it was constructed mainly in 1862 and then reinforced a little bit in 1863. But most of the work um, on the Damoc Line was done by enslaved African Americans. And then here you know, on June 15th, you have um, some former slaves, but a lot of free men from the North uh, in the 18th Corps. And um, they're attacking these <laughs> fortifications that had been built by enslaved people find that kind of ironic. Um, Very rewarding these, attacking those and probably holding those things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they do uh, tremendous work. Um, defending is um, General Beauregard, which is who stretch really thin. Now at this time, um, Lee still doesn't know exactly what Grant is doing um, in his fortifi- fortifications up near Cold Harbor. He still thinks that Grant is going to make a move or the James River, um, and then dart up southeast of Richmond and capture Richmond. So Grant's bridge is not built across that that large pontoon bridge that is so famously captured in photographs and just history alone. That that's not built yet. Yeah, no. Okay. He he crossed the army um, on the fifteenth, so it's built the day and, of the battle, pretty much. Yeah, Lee just gotcha. doesn't know what's going to happen, so he continues to stay up near Richmond, and. Uh, Beauregard's being asked to cover the Bermuda 100, which is mm-hmm. that peninsula of land between the James and Appomattox rivers and also the defenses on the east side of Petersburg. So he stretched really thin. Um, and he's going to be, Beauregard's going to be on his own hook uh, for the first three days of fighting, really. And it's not going to be until, I think, the evening of the 17th when Lee finally starts sending men down from Richmond to Petersburg to help uh, Beauregard defend. So, um, but yeah, those black troops, um, they roll up uh, batteries uh, six, seven, eight, and nine uh, along the Damoc line, uh, capturing a lot of soldiers, Confederate soldiers, and um, a significant amount of artillery as well. And it pushes them back. Um, they're going to have to fall back and, and re entrench a temporary line uh, near Harrison's Creek. And then they're going to fall back to a main line that they're going to hold uh, throughout the rest of the campaign until Petersburg falls on April 2nd, 1865. So they do a tremendous job that first day, those USCT troops. Well, the USCTs throughout the war seem to have an almost impeachable record. Yeah, absolutely. No, they do really well. They're asked to do some um, um, unenviable things Mm. uh, to take some very difficult positions and sometimes they're successful and sometimes they're not but um they do earn respect through their hard fighting that's that's no doubt and that's the biggest hurdle that they have to face is the the prejudice against them 
whether yeah, they're former slaves or they're freemen from the north, mm. it really doesn't matter to your average white soldier in the Army of the Potomac. They're still black, and they um, are— and they're, and they're not convinced they'll we'll make good soldiers until they see it firsthand. That's right. Right, so they have Case something to prove. Evidence. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's really the the show that they're looking for there, if you will, when they attack those fortifications. And they're batteries, if I'm not mistaken, right? They are uh, artillery emplacements. Yeah, there's right. 55 artillery emplacements around Jeez. the Damas line, which rings Petersburg. And the ones that get attacked first by um, Grant and the 18th Corps. Now, I don't want to get people are too confused, but the 18th Corps at this time and throughout the rest of the, the time, it's ex in existence as part of the Army of the James, so it's kind of on loan mm. to the Army of the Potomac in these first attacks. And to clarify, Army of the James is Butler's army. That's Butler correct. would be in command of that, right? Yeah, so that's mainly the Army of the James is the 18th Corps and the 10th Corps. Mm. And the 10th Corps gets detached at different times, but yeah. Right. Yeah, for those aren't familiar, if you know at least the fact that Butler's in the Army of the James, just look at it as he's loaning one of his corps to Meade and Grant. Yeah. Yeah, easy as that. But that that's it's crazy to think that there's a shifting corps around like that, because you have Burnside pretty much acting as independent corps command and just running around as a random corps. Attached to the Army, sure, Grant's still got you know superiority over that, but he's still just kind of running around there doing his own thing. Well, by yeah. Petersburg, they've got Burnside directly under Meade by that point. He'd agreed to serve under, under Meade, right? Or is that does that happen later? That's true. I think that occurs during the Overland campaign. Was that during Overland? Was that after yeah, Spotsylvania? I, I, or? I think it's shortly after Spotsylvania that Burnside formally agrees to, I thought it to, was later. to function under Meade. Yeah. I always had it after the crater. I guess, yeah, I should have looked. I didn't even think it was the Overland campaign. I always thought yeah, that crater was like the last, but I, I should have thought about that because Meade's in command over yeah, Burnside. I, I, I think it right. becomes pretty clear to Grant pretty quickly that having the Ninth Corps as this weird pseudo separate command was not working. Yeah. No, it, it didn't at all. Specifically, Spotsylvania. Uh, there, it, we could even go as far as north and uh, but then again is he still an independent command yeah he would be in, in no 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 because he's marching under orders of Meade and grant at that point arnie to go down yeah. to uh yeah that would be okay so that makes more sense but then you have you know you throw in the on this the second core and the fifth core and the sixth core none of those guys are really involved on the um the 15th it's going to be the 16th, 17th, and 18th, those next three days of fighting, mm -hmm. that they're going to come into play along with the Ninth Corps. Um, and like I said, by the, the night of the 17th into the 18th is when you get all these guys from the Army Northern Virginia down here to bolster the defenses at Petersburg. And you have that really big debacle of the first main heavy artillery making the charge against the fallback line um, there on the 18th, where, what, they have 950 guys that go into the attack, and 600 and some of them end up either killed or wounded. Mm. It's just a tremendous. A lot of people say, you know, the reason they did that is because they'd spent most of the war in the defenses around Washington and had no infantry experience. And then some people say that, well, the reason they they took those is because they wanted to um, prove themselves as, as good infantry soldiers. It's probably a combination of both. The guys that are around them, they all hit the dirt, but these first main heavy artillery guys, they just continue forward and get shot to pieces. Hmm. Now, I believe it's the largest single regiment loss of the war, if I'm not mistaken. Is it? Yeah. I know the well, first I mean, Minnesota's the, the got... Were, the heavies were big. Um, yeah, they were large regiments. Because they hadn't seen much combat in the mm -hmm. defenses of Washington, they got the nickname mm -hmm. Lincoln's Pets. <laughs> they they were oversized to begin with, correct? They were they were over they were well they at full strength in theory. They were supposed to be well over a thousand men, which is significantly larger than the standard regiment. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, pamphlet part. The reason they did it because they spent most of the war in the defenses around Washington. Uh, no, go ahead. Okay, uh, pamphlet part would. We talk about some of those trenches that we see at these battlefields. Uh, I have been absolutely impressed with the works I've seen there, especially 
going around towards the uh, specifically the Arthur's Swamp Dam that's built there in the trench works. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that with me? Uh, I've not really been able to find a lot of research on it. Maybe I'm just not looking in the right places. But I find that in itself just one of the most I don't know how to describe it. It's just amazing that they could engineer something like that out of just a trench work and that they've yeah. used it for multiple things, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, as far as we understand it, the dams that the Confederates built there on the park grounds and have survived, the remnants of them were not in operation because the stream that they had dammed flowed in an unfavorable direction. Um, it flowed toward the Union attackers, so it backed up the water toward the Confederates. Mm. Now, they did make good use of dams in other places. The biggest one is over um, near Battery 45 on Rahoic Creek, and it makes a huge lake during the winter of 1864-65 by backing up that water, and um, it finally busts, I think in January of 65, (laughs) And it just washes everything from the dam down to the Appomattox River, which Rahoat Creek flows into. Uh, but yeah, they try to use every geographical uh, feature that the Confederates can to try to make sure their defenses hold. The the line of earthworks that are um, that run through where Pamplin Park is today were meant to keep open General Lee's last two supply lines. Um, by that point in the fall of 1864, Grant had already cut um, the Petersburg and Norfolk Railroad that ran to the southeast, the Petersburg, uh, and also known as the Weldon Railroad, which ran to the south, and several wagon roads as well. So all they had at that point in the fall of 1864 was the Boyden Plank Road and the Southside Railroad, which ran uh, west to Lynchburg, Virginia. So they built the line of earthworks that came kind of a, as a spur running to the southwest off the, the mock line to keep those two supply lines bringing things into Petersburg. Um, so they made those earthworks particularly impressive. Yeah. Um, they spent months and months building on those. And if you've been over to the Union line, Across the way, it's about a mile away. I haven't yet, but I do. There's a, it's a fort, isn't it? A specific yeah, fort. Yeah, you got Fort Fisher and Fort Welch and Fort Gregg. Ooh. Um, so it's not like over on the eastern front, uh, where the ne- Petersburg National Battlefield is. Right. Where you know it's a matter of what 100, 150 yards, some places between the Union and Confederate lines. Uh, it's about a mile apart, over on the western, southwestern corner where Pamplin Park is now. And that's what made it most vulnerable? Because um, that's the, where they really line the attack on April 2nd, right, with the breakthrough? Yeah, so they're going to actually attack in two different places. The Ninth Corps is going to attack over at what is known as um, Fort Mahone or Fort Hell. Um, excuse me, Fort Damnation. Yeah, Fort Damnation. And, and then you have uh, the Sixth Corps attacking where Pamplin Park is okay. there. Yeah, that, that... It's going to take a lot of stuff, of course, to, to put all that into place. I mean, the victory at Five Forks the day before on April 1st is really what spurs Grant to make that last um, attack on a, the morning of April 2nd with the Ninth Corps um, east of town and then the Sixth Corps southwest where we are. Hmm. Yeah, see, I, like I said, it's just being at Pamplin and being able to hear these stories of something I still really don't know quite a bit about, but I'm very fascinated by it, and I, I really want to find material that I can start reading up <clears throat> to get a better understanding. Um, and I know yeah. I hate to change the topic and ask about books, but since we love books so much, I would like to actually get your idea on what would be good reading material for a lot of the stuff we're talking about tonight. Um, just so our readers have an idea, and even myself, if I don't have it on my shelf, I'd like to pick it up for sure. Yeah, um... The scholarship on the Petersburg campaign has really just blown up in the last 10 or 12 years. Mm-hmm. Um, before that, there just wasn't much out there, and but it's become much more studied as people understand the significance of this campaign to the end of the war. Right. For so long, it had got ignored, and people had viewed Petersburg as just being a stagnant siege. But that's not true. You know, For those nine and a half months that they're here, the two armies, uh, there's all these different moves going on between Grant and Lee and Meade. 
uh, trying to cut these railroads and these wagon roads to um, reduce the opportunity for Confederates to get supplies into Petersburg and to serve Richmond. So there's just been a tremendous explosion of research and, and writing in the past 10 years or so. Probably the good one to start with would be um, Will Green's recent book called Yep, um, I got that. Campaign of Giants. It's a good place and to start. That, yeah, that takes the campaign from the crossing of the James River after Cold Harbor um, right up to the end of the crater. And then he's got a volume two, I think, in the works right now, and then eventually, hopefully, a volume three. Oh, man. So we're getting them. Yeah, because that, that <laughs> book size is it's respectable. So, I mean, having yeah. three of those, whew, fun well, stuff. Will's book, earlier. 29 pages. <laughs> Will's earlier book. Um, it first was published through Savas Beatty, and then it was republished through the University of Tennessee Press. Really? Called Breaking the Backbone of the Rebellion covers um, those last battles, basically the 8th and ninth offensives. And it's excellently written as well. Now, is that something you can pick up at Pamplin Park? Uh, yeah, I think we've got copies of that. Cool. I might have to swing down there in a couple of weeks. Plus, I haven't been, are you guys are still open during this stuff, too? That might be something interesting to actually talk about. Are we open for business? Are we able to come visit? Well, right now we're closed for the winter months, so we'll okay. open back up on uh, Tuesday, March 2nd. March 2nd. All right, so I'll come down to March, yeah. March then. That's when I'm going to come pick so that we'll up. So we'll be open, uh, we're planning at least being open from, you know, Tuesdays through Sundays, uh, closed on Mondays. Okay. Yeah, I got to come renew my membership. I got one last year for the first time. I want to get another one. Oh, great. Hey, appreciate yeah. the support. Oh, of course. You're definitely easily one of my favorite parks in the entire Civil War industry. I've been able to go in there and really enjoy each and every trip and learn something new every time. And like I said, eventually I do want to really give that a proper study because it is just, there's so much to it. I think that's why I haven't really been able to kind of just jump right in and start picking it up because I know how daunting this is going to be. There's so much to cover. Yeah. And it's, it's a long uh, battle. <laughs> you know? Yeah, nine and a half months, 200 right. days. A lot of military action, even for someone who is just absolutely amazed by military maneuvers. I mean, I'm still looking at it like, oh, crap. That's a lot. Yeah, every, every one of these um, offensives that Grant pushes forward, well, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, he's always combining, sending some troops up to threaten Richmond, hoping he can pull away troops from Petersburg and then making mm -hmm. a move to Petersburg. So there are these double actions. Fort Harrison is one of my favorite. Yeah, the poor unfortunate people that are usually getting sent up and then back is the second corps under Hancock. So he gets really, <laughs> he gets worn out um, going back and forth. Yeah, a lot of marching. Mm, mm, mm. I mean, Fort Harrison's not part of Petersburg, but it is a part of Richmond National Battlefield Park. That's correct. Okay. That's part of the 5th Offensive. Mm hmm. Um, the time that uh, September 29th, he's going to send troops, the 18th Corps and the 10th Corps, um, through Deep Bottom, just southeast of Richmond, to try to threaten the defenses there. And he's combining it again with a move down here uh, at Petersburg, which results in what's known as the Battle of Peebles Farm. Okay. So. I'm not familiar that, with that battle, actually. There's, there's not much been done on it. Um, well, there is a big study, actually. Richard Summers' book called okay. Richmond Redeemed. I have that right here, too. No kidding. People's it Farms is, in that? Yeah, it is a microscopic history of the 5th Offensive. <laughs> <laughs> so what I've been told today, uh, that this is the condensed version yeah, of his dissertation. His dissertation, <laughs> yeah. <Good laughs> many, God. many more pages. <laughs> he boiled it down somehow. Yeah. I, I couldn't do it. That's a lot. I mean, but this is impressive, too, the, the dearth of information that he could come up with. Yeah, yeah. Well, the guy worked at, um, I think that was part of his dissertation, but he went on to work at um, the Army College at Carlisle, so he had tremendous access to, to some great records, oh, yes, primary sources. When you have that access and that, you know, that is a job. It never hurts. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. I guess not, huh? But now you would, now you would recommend that one because... Uh, I was told by a historian that it was the cure to insomnia, and I found that it was the exact opposite. I was, I was impressed by it, and that's one it's of the few been, that I've uh, read. Yeah, it's been revised, I think, for the sesquicentennial. Savas Beatty put out a, a re mm -hmm. issue of that book. 
and um, I haven't compared them to see how much was changed. I've you have the, the original? One. I've got the Richmond Redeemed, yeah, the old one. Is that the and full think, version, or is that the one's condensed as well? It's condensed, yeah. Okay, good, good, good. I was about to say, I hope there's not a full version. I know uh, it, there's a PDF online, I think, of the full version. Oh, wow. I'd, I'd like to look at it and just see like what more there is. Because <laughs> I'm sure there's probably some good stuff within that with it being you know so vast you probably could find some things we i may of course i may never known but just a whole lot of new things that take place the the other interesting engagement of that fifth offensive of course is the fighting that the uscts do at new market heights um, i was going to ask you to explain that today because i was told to ask about that so while they're attacking at fort harrison with two divisions um, of the 18th Corps, the mm -hmm. 3rd Division of the 18th Corps is attacking at Newmarket Heights, and that's the all-black division. Right. Um, two brigades, or excuse me, three brigades. And they're successful, although they get, um, again, shot to pieces by the Texas Brigade. They're going to push those Texans um, out of their defenses along Newmarket Heights Road, and they're going to have to fall back to the main defenses just south of Richmond, those Confederates are. And 14 of the black soldiers are going to eventually receive a medal of honor for their actions. And that's 14 out of what, 18? Of the entire war? Um, yes, that's correct. Yep. There was one given to uh, William, yeah. William Carney at um, Fort Wagner in South Carolina. Uh, one by um, a USCT soldier at the crater. And then one that was issued in 2001 to a soldier at uh, the Battle of Honey Hill, South Carolina. But the other 14 um, were all Newmarket Heights soldiers. And most of them were uh, NCOs, so your sergeants, your corporals. After a lot of the white officers got shot, they ended up leading their men continuing forward in this attack. So. They had a heavy burden on their shoulders, but they certainly delivered. Yeah. I mean, and I think the 14 Medal of Honors alone is pretty impressive. Yeah. Absolutely. My most um, uh, impressive story is um, Corporal Miles James, who was in the um, 36th Forward Infantry. Okay. And during the attack, he gets hit in the left arm, and he refuses to leave the field. He's still trying to load and fire his musket with one arm mm. and uh, eventually after the battle he's taken to a field hospital his left arm's amputated and then he makes a special request of his um, colonel to continue mm -hmm. in the service to be issued a sword instead of a rifle because he can't hold a rifle and he stays in the service <laughs> jeez wow guy's a trooper huh no doubt yeah no kidding so yeah, those are some interesting battles to look into as well. I think that might be worthwhile studying, is, I mean, at least going back and reviewing Richard Summers' work. Almost all the offensives have had at least one book written on them. The, the second offensive, which was June 22nd and 23rd, mm -hmm. uh, combined action of the 2nd Corps and the 6th Corps to try to cut the um, Weldon Railroad, it's unsuccessful. No one's really done an in-depth study on the second offensive, although it's really fascinating. There's a book called uh, A Melancholy Affair at the Weldon Railroad, which looks at the Vermont Brigade, which pretty much got decimated by um, William Mahone's Confederates. I reenact with the uh, 12th Virginia, so I when I we do out and some stuff like that, so I'm familiar with Mahone's stuff. Yeah. And then the, the other offensive that hasn't really received any attention is... Um, the 7th Offensive, which is the fighting at Hatcher's Run, February 5th, 6th, and 7th. I've never so even been able to read anything up on that. I've been trying to because that's something I've always been... There was a painting or a, a sketch of these guys carrying lanterns in the woods, carrying over the some of the wounded. Is that That's from Hatcher's Run, I imagine. I that's mean, right. At least that's what it said. That's what got me interested in it. That, that picture alone was one of the most, I, I think, opening eye-opening moments that I got when it came to just the carnage after the fact, because it's a haunting sketch. I'll see if I can pull it up and put it in the video here for those that are watching. But it's, yeah, I mean, you, you want to talk a little bit about Hatcher's Run if you're, I'm sure you know quite a bit about it. 
Yeah, so they get a, a little bit of a break in the weather. Uh, they've been in winter quarters since late October here at Petersburg, and they get a warm front comes in and dries the roads a little bit. So what does Grant do but wants to move forward? And uh, they start moving forward. And um, it just like always happens in almost every one of these offensives, as they move forward, the Confederates come out of their earthworks and attack. It's always this attack and counterattack, every offensive. And um, they're able to pretty much blunt the Union advance. Um, I guess the most famous episode is when General John Pegram gets killed. Um, I think it's on the 6th. He just had um, married who was the woman that was known as the most beautiful woman in the Confederacy, Hetty Carey, in Richmond three weeks before. And um, he'd come back to, to lead his men. And he's killed in this battle. But it's fought in, in really heavy, dense forest for the most part there at Hatcher's Run. It does result in the, the Union Army extending their entrenchments a little bit and thus forcing Lee to have to defend more ground and, and lengthen his lines with fewer men. But it doesn't really result in any positive gains other than that. And during the middle of the fighting uh, on the 6th, the weather turns back cold and it just snows and sleets and rains and um, soldiers are just miserable. So it's back to winter quarters again until um, March. <laughs> and that's when Grant starts putting the finishing touches on things with the movements uh, starting on March 25th. And of course, Lee sort of gets the ball started with the attack at Fort Stedman uh, on March 25th, east of Petersburg. But on the same, on the same day later in the afternoon, the sixth Corps uh, over near where Pamplin Park is now moves forward and they capture a significant amount of ground, the Confederate picket line, and it forces the Confederates to have to fall back closer to their main line. And it's really that action on the afternoon of March 25th that gives the Union opportunity, uh, Union Army opportunity to see some weaknesses in that Confederate line that runs through Pamplin Park and that they're going to eventually exploit five days later uh, at the breakthrough. Right. Well, I'm trying to think of another Petersburg engagement I'd like to ask you about because I haven't there's so many that well, we haven't really talked about the crater yet and that's an important one if not we could probably talk quite a bit into the crater i have a little bit of understanding on that one and um i've, I've read two books on that i read the uh into the crater by hess i'm sure you yeah read that. and that's then probably the best one is it good to know i've got the crater in modern memory or memory one that, by kevin levin i do yeah. enjoy his work quite a bit and i figured that would be an appropriate yeah. kind of study with it. And then the last, well, I have another one also, but my favorite one is Mike Cavanaugh and William Marvel's credit, the Battle of the Crater, that horrid pit. Mm -hmm. And that's a good one as well. That yeah. I haven't read yet. The crater's but, probably drawn more attention um, than any other engagement during the Petersburg camp. And I think a lot of it has to do with the uniqueness of the attempt. <laughs> yeah. What really happens is after that fighting ends on um, June 18th, the Ninth Corps um, is positioned really close to the Confederate line that they had fallen back to. And in the Ninth Corps, there's a regiment of Pennsylvania coal miners, and they put the idea forth to the brigade commander, and it kind of goes up the chain of command all the way to Grant uh, about the idea of digging a mine underneath the Confederate works and then filling it full of gunpowder and blowing it up and marching right into Petersburg. Um, Burnside's on board with it as commander of the Ninth Corps. Meade's a little bit skeptical of it. General Grant says, well, let, let them work. At least give them something to do. So they start digging this mine at the end of um, June. It takes them about a month, I think. Finally dig this 510-foot tunnel. It's only about uh, four, four and a half feet high, I think. Mm -hmm. And they're using cracker boxes, hardtack boxes to take the dirt out. And, um, it's all sort of under disguise because of the 
rolling nature of the terrain, so the Confederates can't see it. But they're getting word that something's going on and they think they can hear stuff. So they start digging countermines to try to, to get them, but they never are able to locate where the Union Army's digging. And eventually they get this thing dug at the end of July and they set the plan for it. And originally, uh, the 9th Corps, along with the 18th Corps, were the only ones in the Army of the Potomac that had black troops. So the 9th Corps had a division under General Edward Ferrero. Hmm. And they were originally the ones that were supposed to make that attack at the crater. Um, now there's some confusion and controversy over whether these guys were actually trained to do this special operation. Um, some uh, officers of these black regiments say they received some training. Some of them say they received a significant amount of training. Other ones say they don't remember receiving any training. So we're not really sure. Um, but apparently they're supposed to go in and go around the crater. But at the last minute, Grant uh, and me decided that it would look bad if they sent these black troops in and they got shot to pieces. It would look bad politically for the Republican Party, look bad for President Lincoln, who of course is wanting to be nominated and elected for that second term. Uh, so at the last minute, they pull out the black troops and probably what is the worst example of leadership Burnside has his other division commanders draw straws. That's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of picking either the freshest troops or the best leader, um, and of course, who draws the shortest straw, but probably the worst commander, uh, James Ledley, who had been drunk at North Anna River. Yep. And, uh, had a horrible reputation. I don't know how he retained his job at that point, but... Uh, he does not go forward with his troops in the attack, which finally kicks off after the explosion. He um, apparently stays behind in a bombproof safe, uh, drinking away with Edward Ferrero, <laughs> the, Corps, uh, the division commander for the black troops. So those guys go forward without much direction, and they push through the crater, and the Confederates are able to rally again, who comes to the Confederates. Uh, saving grace, but William Mahone, who would counterattacks. And then all the divisions of the Ninth um, the Corps finally go in with the Black Division finally being last. And um, a lot of those Black troops, as Kevin Levin in his book really illustrates, they're not allowed to surrender mm -mm. once they get trapped in the earthworks around and inside the crater. There, a lot of them are massacred. Those White troops, the Confederate white troops are just in a fury, uh, first of all, fighting black soldiers who they don't see as being legitimate soldiers. They view black soldiers as slaves in rebellion. And how do you put down a slave rebellion, but with force? With maximum and, force. <laughs> and, and, and their um, view of things. So it's a very, uh, turns into a very bad situation for the USCG troops there. Even some of the Apparently, some of the white officers of the Union troops are trying to disassociate themselves in the confusion and fighting uh, to make sure that they're not associated with the black troops uh, when they're captured. So it um, turns out to be what Grant calls the saddest affair he saw of the war. Great plan on paper, horribly executed, turns, in, turns into a fiasco. Well, in, in some ways, that's kind of the story of the, the Army of the Potomac's experience of the entire war, right? Great plans for execution. Yeah, yeah. But with Grant in charge, he doesn't give up, <laughs> doesn't fall back. Which he, is the difference, of course. It just keeps pushing. He sticks to his to his plans. So the, the fourth offensive, the next one, uh, is mainly fought by the Fifth Corps under Governor Warren, and they're successful in finally cutting that um, Weldon Railroad, which runs south out of Petersburg, ultimately down to Wilmington, North Carolina, um, which is really important. After they cut that railroad, Lee's really hurting to be able to get supplies into Petersburg. And that's August 18th through the 21st, that uh, known as the Battle of Weldon Railroad, sometimes known as the Battle of the Globe Tavern. A lot of these Petersburg battles have several different names. <laughs> 
Well, I, I, I've really enjoyed this discussion. And Tim, do you have anything you'd like to close on tonight or anything you'd like to touch on in specifically today? I'll just put in a plug for um, the park when we open back up in, yeah. in March. Please come down and see us. Um, you know, for what you get for your admission price there, you get the museum, you get the battlefield, you get to learn about antebellum Southern history with Tudor Hall Plantation. Um, if you come down uh, or come up wherever you're coming from, <laughs> um, plan on spending, you know, a good four or five hours there because there's plenty to do and see and learn. So we'd love to have, have your listeners come to the park. No, and absolutely. I, I encourage him to go as well as someone who frequents that park and indeed uh, even has tried to get a membership every year at least because that it's just giving the money back and being able to shop their bookstore and tour their battlefields, learn from their battlefields and experience what they have in their wonderful museum. Um, I, I definitely encourage you to go. And hey, if, you know, one day eventually we've had the idea of uh, doing podcasts from the battlefield one day. I would love to be able to have an opportunity to do it from a trench, or, you know, from a trench area and show them what a trench looks like. Gosh, you that know, would be a great idea. That's what I'm yeah, saying. Have you out there? Please do. Come yeah. down. Unfortunately, I haven't had the, time, the, the chance to get down there myself, but it is definitely on my list. John, we'll have to do that this spring. Absolutely. When they open up, we'll have to go down there and bring it up because I'm working on getting that camera right now for the phones just so we can take them down there and actually have mics and everything. Go, we can meet Tim. Oh, that would be perfect. Yeah, every time I go, I run into Tim, whether he's outside by the uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I love it too. I'm just like, I recognize that guy. <laughs> Last time, the straw hat almost got me. <laughs> I didn't yeah, I think know. I was out cutting some grass. That you day. were. I was just like, is that Tim? That is Tim. So I was like, oh man, it's good to stop and see him. <laughs> Tim but, wears lots of hats. <laughs> I like to hear that's a great analogy. <laughs> I like that. But yeah, folks, I mean, Pamplin, it's just, it's an incredible way to experience a museum, honestly. I, I have not been to one that I can compare. Uh, even Gettysburg pales in comparison when it comes to a museum. And I, I'm not, no offense to Gettysburg, I love them. But I mean, just the, the way Pamplin has interpreted the history and immerses you in it when you walk through that. And the program that they use, it, it there's none other like it. And I mean, the stories that you can be told by doing this and the, the hands-on experiences you have there and... Again, if you have the opportunity, it's not something you should ever pass up. It is incredible, oh, of course, and like it's a very important part. Very important, and that's what got me into Petersburg. I, I've been a little bit over to the crater and stuff, and the Eastern Front is it's cool in its own right. But being able to spend that time at Pamplin and really, it's an, it's more of an intimate story. Yeah, yeah. You know? I think um, what some people say about us is, you know, the the, the National Museum, of the Civil War soldier we really do help put a face to the soldiers. When you, when you mm -hmm. view battle maps, there's these red and blue blocks. Well, those represent actual living, breathing, thinking human beings. And at Pamplin, you get to hear the story about those soldiers. Right. I've got a Keith Rocco painting I got from you guys actually. On my wall, the oh, yeah. soldiers get the mess call one where they're getting their coffee. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I start my day with multiple cups of coffee, as I'm sure any self-respecting anybody has to do, because the coffee is the water of life there. <laughs> yeah, I love those murals in the museum. Oh, they're, they're wonderful. wonderful. They're in, do you guys have any of the paintings by chance that are other, not just this one, but like the mural itself? Like, are, did you guys carry those at one point? I think so, but they probably all sold out. I don't blame them. They, they are wonderful. I was really happy to find this one here. I was like, oh, man, that's perfect. They used to have them printed on postcards and note cards. And um, and Keith Rocco did that for you guys. Yeah. Yeah, back when the museum opened in 1999, he, he painted all those. Um, he's one of my favorite artists. Oh, absolutely. I'll tell you what, too. He looks brand new. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I 1999, I didn't think it was 99. Wow. Uh, you guys take so good care of that exhibit. Now, do you have a favorite part of the exhibit? I should ask um, you that. Cause I, if for folks that have been and that are listening about that, you know, that's that's cool to talk about because like, there's so much. Oh, we did the last room, um, which has a lot of different photographs of soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, recently, we redid that last room. So you get to see all these different photographs of soldiers, Union and Confederate, um, African-American. Um, it's just neat to look around and see the differences and the similarities and um some of them have you know interesting stories some of them have we've got a picture of jesse james up there for instance mm -hmm. uh, a picture of william mckinley when he was a soldier right um some of the medal of honor recipients uh, african-americans so uh, 
I like that last room when you get to see all those pictures of those soldiers and just uh, to know that each one of those individuals had, you know, experiences um, changed their lives forever. Right. I know. Absolutely does. And being able, like I said, to hear that and experience it as you walk through the museum, it's, it's definitely worthwhile. And it'll, it'll, it's a powerful, powerful story, I think, and no matter which soldier you pick or which you know, person you end up picking. I yeah. think each one that I've done so far has always ended powerfully. And it's just simply Good. because of the museum itself. So, Folks, I want to thank you guys for tuning in tonight. And Tim, thank you so much for joining and sharing about Pamplin. We'd love to have you back. We'd get more you know, topical and find a specific Petersburg, just even for a chat. Definitely. You know, we know. absolutely we to. always love to have you back. And folks, again, we will be back on Monday or we might do another little quickie Sunday. We've done that before where the hosts come in and just chat. So we'll try to get something going again just as a recap of everything and then move from there. And we have forgotten fall coming soon, but we all three want to study a little more for that because this one's going to be hopefully into that because we we tend to forget about Bristow Station and Mind Run. And Indeed. It'd be interesting to talk about that. But John, do you have any closing remarks yourself, bud? No, this, but uh, this, has been, this has been great. I always love talking about Petersburg. Cool. Yeah, we'll have to do more at Petersburg because I mean, there's so, like I said, there is a lot. And it's, it, oh gosh, I wish I could read all in one book. All right, guys, y'all have a wonderful evening, wonderful weekend. We will see you back shortly. You guys keep doing the good work you're doing. Yes, sir, we will. You too. You do the same. Yeah, absolutely. You're doing great work too.